Great, and we're live. Welcome everybody to this Hangout on Air. My name is Lisette Sutherland and I'm interviewing people and companies who are doing great things remotely. And today I'm excited because we are going to dive into uh, an area that I know absolutely nothing about. Usually we, talk, we are talking with software developers or people on software teams and today we have Marion Smits on the line who is an associate professor and neuroradiologist at Erasmus in Rotterdam and an honorary consultant and reader at the University College London Hospital NHS Foundation Trust in London. So that's a mouthful. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so, so welcome, Marion. Oh, if people have any questions, please send them from now or in the future to hashtag remote interview and we'll get those answered. But Marion, go ahead and let's have you introduce yourself. Oh, thank you. Well, that is a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, so yeah, I, titles and uh, important. Yeah, universities. yeah. So, so I am. I mean, primarily my work is in neuroradiology. So that is what I was trained to do to become a to be a neuroradiologist. So what I I do clinically um, as a sort of medical doctor is that I assess brain scans. That's that's the easy way of putting it. Um, which is what most neuroradiologists would do full time, so that would be their job. But I have also an academic position, so about 50% of my time I spent on clinical work and the other 50% on academic work, which means that I do research and that is what the associate professorship uh, title is about. Um, and at the moment I am on what's called a sabbatical, although I'm actually working quite hard in London at UCL, uh, and that's the other title, the honorary consultant and reader. So that's basically the equivalent um, position I have in Rotterdam and I have that here as a, an honorary position. Um, and yeah, that's, that's a very short <laughs> introduction of what I do and my positions. So do you live then in both Rotterdam and London or do you travel back and forth a lot or what's the situation there? So at the moment, no, I live full time in London now. I'm here for six months so I, am, I have just moved here and uh, I do not intend to travel backwards and forwards. So that was the original plan when I first came up with it, that's how I sold it to my boss and the people I work with and uh, my boyfriend and uh, who decided to come with me in the end. and. Uh, uh, my PhD students, so I have five PhD students in Rotterdam and uh, they were a bit freaked out when I announced that I was going to move to London for six months um, and they, um, but you know, and then at first I thought well I'll go and see them once every two weeks, travel back for a long weekend and see them on a Friday or a Monday, but in the end at the moment I just, yeah, supervise them remotely, um, so, uh, uh, so yeah. Okay, so you know, from London to Rotterdam is a pretty short flight. It's a pretty it quick one, actually. It is. So an hour, you're there, and you can even bike to the Rotterdam airport. So it's pretty easy to come back. But you've decided to supervise them remotely, and I'm curious, like, what does that entail, and how is it going? Yeah, so it's actually going really, really well. So what we, um, I mean, we had to get used to it a little bit um, at first, and mostly because we could see each other on Skype on ourselves on the camera all the time, and we're all checking our hair all the time. Uh, but we got <laughs> we got past that, <laughs> and it's actually, I mean, we found very quickly actually a way of working remotely. I mean, I, I, in Rotterdam, I see them once a week anyway. They have to, they're not in an office nearby, they have to walk 15 minutes. I mean, the hospital Erasmus MC is absolutely huge campus, so they're in a separate tower. Uh, so I didn't see them, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis anyway. So at the, actually, I see them just as regularly now as I did, but just now over Skype, then um, I saw them in Rotterdam, but then pers in person. A lot of our work um, is that I mean, it's, it's different, but a lot of them are mostly writing papers and need help with the writing. So they send me the paper by email, I send them my comments back uh, just in the Word document, and we over Skype discuss it. We use screen share a lot as well on Skype so that they can point out things that they are, have questions about or um, they want to discuss further. Um, the other 
thing that we've started using a lot, but again, we already started that in Rotterdam, is that we have shared Dropbox folders quite a lot. So when they have a document or a large data set or something that I need to look at, um, they would put it in the Dropbox folder and I can just look at it at my in my own time. Um, so that is, I mean, not that different actually from when we were in the same place. Um, so it's just the, the, the personal meetings we had once a week that are now remote, but you know, that's, we can still talk, we can still see each other. So, uh, so it's actually not that different and it works really well. Yeah, it seems, you know, it seems that the only, the, there's a couple of senses that are missing, which are important. I mean, you don't have the sense of really the touch or smell, and maybe smell is okay. But, uh, but, there, but there are whole senses that are missing when we do it over Skype. However, we still have the sight and we still have the sound, and those are sort of the main ones that are needed. And the ability, I mean, is there any degradation in the relationship at all because you're doing it via Skype? No, I don't think so. I, 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 I really do prefer seeing, seeing them. I, I, do, I do want the visual input, as you say. You need the senses. And um, I, yeah, I don't think I'll miss, miss much uh, compared to when I, I mean, I don't think, oh, well, it's going to be so much easier when I'm back. I've joked, actually, about this because they have to, I mean, they have to walk. I make them walk to my office in Rotterdam, uh, the 15 minutes there and back. I said, well, you know, we can just continue this on Skype when I'm back in Rotterdam. And they, and, and they were like, yeah, 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 it's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> time, I'm assuming. So, yeah, exactly. 15 minutes is 15 minutes. And on the other hand, they exactly. have to get 15 minutes back. That's half an hour in a day. So, I mean, exactly. it does add up. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it was a joke, but it was for both of us actually like, yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Uh, the other thing I do with them, uh, once every two weeks I have the whole group together, so my whole research group, them as well as some other uh, people that are interested in our work, some students, uh, or our work, not just my work. And um, so we have a regular meeting every two weeks. And um, and again, we, I mean, that is a bit easier when I'm present, but again, we, we still do that over Skype. So they will have me on the iPad and, uh, and they sort of, make sure that I can see the screen or the person that's talking and uh, and it does actually work surprisingly well um, because I've, I've even chaired meetings like that and uh, yeah they, uh, the interaction I mean everybody got used to it quite quickly so um, right again saves me a lot of time because that meeting is always <laughs> at a distance for me so, so I can just they're all in the same room together and you're yeah. on the iPad yes yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, the only, to, oh, sorry. No, no, no. The only thing that's sort of missing is my remote control to sort of control my iPad, as it were, in the meeting. Right, so. like the movement that you could have there. Yeah, exactly. you could get a telepresence robot, which they have now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would that would be perfect. So, so uh, you said that you mentioned in the beginning when you were first moving that your students were a little bit freaked out by the distance. So what was it that they found so, I mean, no, you know, I'm sure they knew about Skype and video, so I yeah. know they knew that they you would have contact, but what do you think? I think, I mean, I think we both had to, or we all had to get used to the idea that we wouldn't be seeing each other face to face, although we do actually see each other face to face now, but we, we'd never used that before. So, um, so I think they were just worried that they would lose contact, would lose touch, and um, and I think, yeah, I think we're we're all quite happy with the situation now. It's it's in a way it's almost better because we're better prepared generally. Um, there's also no leeway of if you know because you have to be you have to be at the certain time you know online and. Um, no, I mean, what happens a lot is that the students, when they come to me, they go and grab a tea or coffee and then sort of wander around a bit. And, and I mean, we have that flexibility, which is fine, but we have a much better time management at the moment um, because oh. the next one is going to be on the line. And, and I can say, well, the next one's on the line. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll hang up. And, and so it's actually much easier even to for them as well um, to... Uh, and it's more focused, it sounds like. Like you, it's more focused. Yeah, exactly. And um, they've, yeah, I've I've noticed with them as well that some of them um, they share uh, an office with a lot of other people, so it's quite 
uh, so they want to work from home sometimes as well and and they started sort of doing this Skype or meetings from home as well which for them I, I can see that they're much more relaxed that they have been having a sort of quiet day at home preparing the meeting making sure that everything is ready and which is somehow much better than uh, the sort of rushed state we're usually in when we're in the office and uh, yeah trying to fit meetings in and people barging in you know it's, it's and whereas when you're on the Skype you can say I'm on the Skype you, you can't sort of um, just interrupt yeah so actually it's more focused and, and much easier I find so you said that now is it because um, that you're having these remote Skype meetings that they're actually working from home sometimes yeah because for them it there's no need to come into the office um, and and that does mean that they can take their time as well at home to prepare the meetings yeah one of them was actually uh, has just had a baby so she was pregnant for the last few months and uh, and had to work from home because you couldn't move anymore she was just and and again it was so easy to just keep in touch with her this way so uh, yeah I can imagine I mean I remember in university I would look into the grad student offices and it's usually like an office with or man made these are PhD. I don't know. I'm just I, yeah, I, it's the really, same. <laughs> yeah, and I was I was looking in and I would see, you know, like four or five people in one room trying to do work together and I always thought like I mean, I really need I the different people need different things. I need to be totally alone. And so working yeah. in that sort of environment would be very hard for me. So so it's interesting now that people are choosing to work from home for the same reason. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean, in a way, you need both because I'm very happy that they are in the same room together because then they can talk and they can exchange ideas. But yeah, if they have to be focused, and that's why I agreed with them when they said, "Well, yeah, can we work from home for one day a week?" It's like, yeah, of course, I do that one day a week. I need the people around me, but I also need a bit of peace and quiet to really concentrate sometimes. So, is this unusual in the academic setting? Is the working from home unusual? What's What's that world? In the academic setting, it's not so unusual. It is unusual for for clinical for clinicians. Um, so for yeah, the people that work in the hospitals as doctors, basically, because you're supposed to be always there, and um, and you're expected to be there and expected to be available, and um, and that is um, so. Then there is no real working from home, even though again. I have the facilities to actually do also my clinical work from home. So, uh, so this is interesting. Then, so then the expectation, the culture in the clinical setting, is to be there, and I can kind of see it because you'd think, oh, if you need to be around patients or yeah. people, then of course you would want to be there. But you're not always around patients. Exactly, and especially my work as a radiologist. I mean, we do have, we do see some patients. We do have some outpatient clinics for ultrasound, which is hands-on, so you have to be there. But a lot of our work is just looking at scans, and um, and in fact, we are based in three different locations in the hospital. So it doesn't matter whether the scan is done in one hospital. I look at it in a different hospital. So we already, in a way, it's almost remote working, even though you're. At work, but you know, in a different hospital. Uh, um, and one hospital is doing the actual scans and uploading exactly. them somewhere, and you're at a different hospital looking at the scan. So exactly, exactly, I'm uh, making sort of my findings available again to all of the hospitals, so especially to the referring clinician. Um, so in a way, we we have all of the facilities, and um, and I could I could potentially also do that from home. So. Um, Except that it's not in the culture. Exactly, exactly. So we're not. I, I can do it when I'm on call, so out of office, but not um, not when I'm supposed to be, uh, not during the working day. Yeah. Now it's interesting because um, in the computer world, it's very normal. I mean, people are you know with open source and software development, a lot of people are very used to working from wherever. But it sounds like in the clinical world that this is a new. Maybe it's yeah. a new concept, and is it a new concept? Is it something that's being discussed? Is it does it come up, or is it still? It's it 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 does get discussed. I know in our department it did get discussed because we had uh, well we had a problem with um, uh, understaffing. So uh, 
at some point the people working part-time were asked whether they would be interested in the option of starting to work full-time but then you know the day that they had taken as a part-time day uh, to work from home so that they could still to a certain extent you know um, obviously not with a newborn baby but you know to, to just be at home and um, and still work um, there was some interest, but it never really took off, uh, to be honest. And I, I, I don't hear of people doing this, um, yeah, regularly. Um, again, there are some, but they, that's not really hospital-based. There are some private diagnostic clinics, like, like the what's in the Netherlands, the MRI Center, which is just a basically a scanning facility where they have radiologists working actually from home. So they and these are generally people that do this as a well, a little extra, or actually retired radiologists who uh, mm. who then keep up their skill um, by by doing this. But that's again, that's that's those are new concepts um, that have not really made it to the normal hospital practice. No, um, I could conceive it working. I mean, it it, it does work. Um, we just need a change of culture. Right, because it seems like the impression that I get when I think of, of hospitals is that um, doctors and uh, they work really long hours, or and people involved in hospital work. It's my impression. I don't know if it's accurate, but the, it seems like there's long shifts and long weird hours, and people are away from their families and. Yeah, so d d d we definitely work long hours and um, weird hours. As well, but it, like I said, when I'm, I mean, the working day is still sort of well, eight to six, Monday to Friday. Um, anything outside that would be considered on call uh, time, so evening, nights, and weekends. Um, so it's that is per. I mean, for for me, we have, I mean, we have junior doctors on who will be in the hospital because they need to, that obviously there need to be people there. But um, but for me, it's perfect. I mean, that is perfectly acceptable that I'm not in the hospital and that I log in remotely when I'm called um, to to look at a scan. I mean, it's never going to be. But that's true. I think for any kind of work, you always need to be in touch with your colleagues some somehow. I mean, um, especially in the Erasmus MC is a university hospital where we train a lot of. Well, medical specialists as well, students and, and medical specialists, so residents or registrars. And of course, again, we can do that remotely. We can we can do that on the phone and look at a scan together. But it is nicer and easier if you're sitting next to each other and know what you're. I mean, you can point at things and stuff. I mean, the technology we use uh, doesn't allow for screen sharing, for instance. So that that does make it easier to just be there. But again, you know. In a way, we have a system where one person will sit in a corner and do, you know, look at the scans and not be disturbed, whereas another person will be doing, you know, the resident supervision and talking to the clinicians and answering the phone and whatever. So in a way, we've already created that system um, that you, yeah, somebody doesn't get disturbed and that person could easily be at home, of course, uh, well, which I would really like, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, it seems that given the weird hours at times and given the long hours at times, that if there are things that can be done in a more comfortable, quiet, or you know whatever it is that's nice for the person, but in your own setting, yeah, then that would be very useful. Yeah. And you bring up an interesting concept of understaffing, which comes up a lot in the development world as well, except for that people are more looking for specific talent. But I guess... I mean, in a, in a situation where there's understaffing, now this seems like a really interesting opportunity for remote work. Yeah, yeah, it is. And um, um, especially for, for sort of uh, more specialist jobs, as you say, as well. And, and in a way, that's also, um, I, mean, that's, I mean, that's sort of on the, um, not particularly clinical, but I do quite a lot of specialist stuff as well due to my research, but I implement that a lot in clinical practice. So when I left for six months, um, there was no way I could let anybody else do this. I'm the only person in Rotterdam who can do this. So those tasks I still do, even though it's clinical work. Um, so I, I use remote desktop to do my analyses and um, 
you know, I, I am in direct contact with the clinicians, with the surgeons to, uh, to, to tell them my findings. So again, that's quite easily done uh, remotely. Right, it seems like you're showing it by in this experiment of moving to, to London for six months that you're showing that this work yeah. can actually be done remotely. Yeah, at the danger, of course, that uh, that they're not really realizing that I'm gone, <laughs> not letting me alone, leaving me alone. So uh, that's yes, uh, but not showing that it's working. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, has there been any uh, any real challenges with doing your work since moving? I mean, are there communication issues, or I mean, if you're saying that they, you know, they don't really know that you're gone? Almost, yeah. I think that's that's the biggest problem, actually. <laughs> the biggest challenge is letting them know that uh, I'm not actually available for everybody at all times, and that's, um, you know, it it it's so easy. I mean, my secretary at the beginning would just plan meetings and and say, "But you've got Skype." I was like, "Yeah, but the whole point is that I am away, so I'm available for my students and my collaborators, but I'm not available for just about everybody who wants to talk to me. They have to wait until I'm back." And uh, and that <laughs> that was actually that still is a bit of a challenge to be honest. So uh, because it's almost like you're always on. Yeah, yeah, and that is my challenge, of course, as well. That is the difficulty. It's. I can do my work anywhere, almost all of my work anywhere, and um, and and it's very easy then to just always work. And I love my work, so again, that yeah, <laughs> doesn't doesn't help. But uh, what, so what boundaries have you put in place for yourself? Because I I have the same thing. I love my work, and sometimes my boyfriend is saying, "I need some attention." <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I think, oh right, sorry, sorry. But what what things have you put in place for yourself for productivity to sort of not always be on twenty four seven because this comes up a lot with yeah, people who are doing knowledge. Yeah, I, don't, I I have to say I'm not very good at it. I mean, at some point it just gets so bad that I tell myself, okay, no email after eight o'clock or after dinner or whatever, and uh, you know I keep that up for a bit and then you know that slips again. And uh, um, I I am quite strict in. I'm quite strict in sort of protecting time where I do exercise and um, and then also just especially for um, you know meetings with you know the states or whatever where they say oh yeah can you make it for nine o'clock in the evening as well no that's just it's just not going to happen and um, it it's uh, but yeah my boundaries are quite yeah weak <laughs> to say. Well, when we love our work, then the work-life yeah. really comes into play. Yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, one of the things I, I guess I do do is that I am, because I, I can be quite flexible with work, but also with not working then, is that I will say, well, okay, I've worked all of the weekend, I've traveled. I mean, when I travel, a lot of my meetings are on the weekend, so I tend to always use the travel time for work. Is that I then, you know, during the week say, okay, well, I'll take a day off and, and that's it and uh, so I do try to compensate a little bit but yeah never enough of course <laughs> there's always right. too much work to do yeah finding balance is always a little this way and then a little that way and then yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah I've, I've only found that I have found it for a moment and then it's off again and then I'm back to yeah, balance exactly. more yeah, yeah. Um, so then you just also mentioned another thing which is uh, traveling a lot which yeah correct so I, yeah I travel a lot I mean again this is not typical of, uh, of a radiologist or a neuroradiologist but it is I guess quite typical of the person of, of sort of a higher academic rank um, and uh, yeah I am I I am invited a lot to teach at um, international courses um, I am I do a lot of European committee work so I'm on a lot of scientific boards or committees and um, a lot of that the meetings are actually done over again Skype or any kind of TCON uh, software or whatever but um, uh, yeah we do I, I still do have to go to a lot of meetings or conferences as I mean again often to lecture to meet people to to network um, and that's yeah I'm on the road a lot um, so I am um, 
yeah, inseparable from my laptop and iPad, <laughs> and I'm generally uh, online a lot. Um, and I, I mean, I love working during travel. I mean, I, I love sort of the focus you can get out of, you know, a long train ride or plane. Or it's, um, yeah, I, I, it's you, you're not. I mean, especially planes. There's no internet and no telephone, so people don't <laughs> bother you. You could just actually sort of get lots of work done. Um, and at airports, I, I have to say I'm quite a relaxed traveller, so I, I don't sort of wander around airports or have to do all kinds of stuff. I just usually find a quiet spot uh, or a lounge or whatever and um, get a coffee and, and just I, I generally actually set the alarm for when I know I have to get to the gate and then should, so I don't even have to look at my watch um, and then uh, do my work. Yeah. And just get in focus. Yeah, yeah. So I don't really, I don't have to think about it then. I, I, I have almost missed a flight once because I was so fo I, I'm waiting at the gate. In fact, so that taught me. <laughs> so, it's only right, because somebody tapped on my shoulder. Yeah, so to said, oh, isn't that your flight? And I was like, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, and at, um, yeah, in hotels, I will always. I will always have the Wi-Fi option, however stupidly expensive it is. But I, I just don't want to think about it anymore. I just, you know, it, it makes life so much easier. And again, those are the times that I can actually focus. I, um, because there's nothing else. I, I, I don't have any other commitments then, and I'm there for work anyway. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not like I travel there for fun. So I mean, I don't have my friends or my boyfriend with me. So I just, you know. Just take the time to to do the work, right? Um, yeah. And is it challenging finding Wi-Fi, or is it just a matter of? Yeah. Well, um, it is. I mean, sometimes it's not. I mean, hotels are generally okay um, for for their Wi-Fi, especially if you pay for it. Um, if it's not, I will complain and say, well, look, this is just, you know, I've paid so much and I, I need this for my work. Um, and if it's, I mean, conferences generally have good Wi-Fi, but yeah, I had a disastrous conference in May uh, where I had so much to do and there was just no Wi-Fi at the conference center. It was officially there, but it wasn't, my hotel was an hour's travel. So it just meant that I was sort of sitting in my hotel room and not going to the conference center, which is a shame because the whole point is that you do use the time between, you know, your meetings or, or whatever to actually go to the conference and, and listen to some interesting talks. So uh, so that was, I mean, that was one example where, yeah, it was very clear that the lack of Wi-Fi really interfered with, <laughs> with the, well, me enjoying the conference. Right. Well, and that is sort of a number one rule of remote working, which is the Wi-Fi has to be great. Yeah, you have to be connected. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's a common travel challenge for people when they're doing work. But uh, it's a it's interesting to bring up the point of being able to focus better while traveling, which is a bonus. So, yeah, not having the internet or the phone on. I found that also in the, <laughs> in my. Yeah. And the importance of having good Wi-Fi when to yeah. travel. So, is that you say that that's not typical of a neuroradiologist to do all this traveling? No, no. Oh. So the typical radiologist, I mean, they would just, I mean, their, their base of work is the hospital, and they would go to one or two conferences a year, uh, a conference or a course to to basically keep up to date. But yeah, I do well at least one a month, uh, if not more. So I usually have two trips a month um, and uh, a lot of that is actually weekend stuff so it's uh, that, that's again that is quite typical of the medical profession that our conferences include the weekend which is the busiest time because that means people will go there they don't have to take up time uh, of work and uh, um, yeah that I have to say that that is a difficult balance to find where where there's a, a few weekends left for spare time. Right, so. I bet. I bet the, the odd hours. Yeah. Really, really can take up drain energy if we're not. Yeah. Careful. Yeah, but that's. I think that's. I mean, that is also typical of our profession. Is that 
you know, you're a bit of a wimp if you complain about working out of hours. You shouldn't have become a doctor if you didn't like that, you know. <laughs> right. So uh, whether that's teaching or doing actual hospital work, you know, obviously in a hospital, you know, patients can get sick at any time or people can get sick at any time. So, yeah, you shouldn't complain about that. But, yeah, doing your actual education or other stuff, um, is uh, yeah, it's a bit ridiculous that it's all out of hours as well. But uh, so yeah. it sounds like if the culture of uh, uh, in the hospital is that people need to be there, and mm. that you have done now this kind of unusual experiment, and that you've you've gone somewhere else, you're not working in the hospital setting, and on top of that, you travel more than most neuroradiologists, and so. Uh, has there been any any kickback from the people that you've worked with? Are there are there people who are not pleased with the situation, or is or is everybody generally understanding? Well, they're, they're mostly understanding. I mean, uh, if anything, some people are envious because they just like the travel too, and they'd like to be on the road too. Um, it's. Uh, I mean, the, the downside for me is because the, especially the sort of, well, the clinical work still needs to be done. So, um, especially the on calls will still fall back on. I mean, I still have to do as many as anybody else. So I have to work as many weekends. I have to work as many evenings because I travel so much. That means there are many weekends that are not in 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 Rotterdam. And therefore, the weekends that I am there, I am very often on call because you know they are. Um, concentrated on those weekends, um, so that is the downside for me. Which you know is fair enough. It's it's just a consequence of, of what I do. Um, I I know. I mean, again, the work still needs to be done. So I know my colleagues do have to cover for me while I'm away, um, which does mean that the days I am there, I tend to take on as much as I can. Um, and also, I am quite often available for them if they do have, you know, issues. I say, well, you should just call me, and I'll log in and I'll look at the scan with you. So, um, so in a way, you're overcompensating then. A little, yeah, a little bit, I suppose. Yeah. Well, overcompensating. I'm trying to compensate. <laughs> right, right. Or, or maybe hyper communicating, over yeah. communicating, and being in touch with people more because you're away. Yeah. But it does sound like, you know, if you're away and then you have to be on call a certain amount just as much as the other people, then when you come back, there's no free weekend at all. There's either you're on very call few. or you're away. Yeah, yeah, very few. Yeah. So, um, yeah, well, now that I'm in London, I'm, I'm not on call. <laughs> so for, for these six months, I'm, I'm actually experiencing free weekends. So uh, I, will, uh, I do realize how nice that is, actually. I'd forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> it's opened up a new world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's going to be tough. Do you think back. the clinical um, culture will change more to be more remote focused? I mean, it sounds like lots of things are set up in order to be able to work remotely. You're already working remotely in some ways. You might be in different places in the same building or in different hospitals, but do you see that culture changing? Maybe a little bit, but not. I, I'm not sure. I mean, we we've been we've been thinking it's going to change a lot, and for radiology especially, we saw a really big threat uh, of um, well, basically outsourcing to cheaper countries, um, and uh, because yeah, it doesn't matter where the scan is is done and where the patient is, as long as there's a report from somebody who's you know good enough to read the scan. Uh, it could be from anywhere, and this sort of teleradiology has been um, has been considered a real threat to radiology, and especially, of course, in the English-speaking countries where you know the Indians can quite easily do uh, you know the, the work for well half the world, uh, and it's also been seen as an advantage because then you don't have to do night shifts anymore because there's always somebody awake somewhere in the world. Um, but somehow that hasn't really, because this has been possible for at least a decade. Um, it's not really taken off that that massively. Um, and again, a lot of, still, um, quite a lot of our work is still um, 
personal, I suppose, to be a person in a meeting where you discuss a patient with the surgeon and with the whatever, whoever is treating the patient. So it's, yeah, I think it's still going to be very much sort of work or um, place based rather than remote, our work. Um, now, I just read about this teleradiology. It was in, I can't remember the name of the book, The World is Flat. It was something like The World is Flat, and, and I was just reading. Also, in uh, Virtual Freedom, the author talks about uh, people who are outsourcing this kind of work to cheaper countries, yeah. to people who, yeah. can, who can read these scans somewhere else. Like you said, that you don't have to do the night shifts anymore. That's... Yeah. So yeah. So, too. It's, it's... But... The, it seems like, I mean, there's still a big element of, um, I think, just of trust um, because it's it's just a tough job. It's just a difficult job and there's always a level of uncertainty. There's always a certain element of interpretation rather than just, you know, just knowing for certain what something is or, I mean, something's obvious. but. The number of scans I get to see that have already been reported by somebody else and then, you know, the, the treating physician says, well, I don't know this person who's reported this scan, could you just have a look at it because I trust you. And and that is such a big element. Uh, and I get that still. I mean, while I'm in London, I sometimes still get that questions like, could you just log in and see whether you agree because we don't know this person. And uh, and it takes people a while to to get used to it, and in a way that's good because you know you want to uh, um, sort of have the treating physician to to do whatever they can to get the right diagnosis. Um, and it's always good to to sort of have several opinions on something that's difficult. Um, so yeah, I I think that's why it never really took off um, because you end up reading the scans anyway. Right, and so it's you're really not really going to outsource and and do the work to so pay double, basically, because you have to do it again anyway. Yeah, after it's yeah. been done. Very interesting, because you're right; it has been around. The capability has been around for a, for over a decade, for sure, and it hasn't taken off. And there's a number of things that are the same way. The, I mean, remote working in general hasn't has been available for. I mean, 25, at least 25 years, if not more, in a real, very serious way, and hasn't taken off as quickly as we thought. And it's interesting that you say that trust is the reason, because that is the reason in every other situation that I've heard as well, is that yeah. people don't trust each other, or they don't trust the results, because they don't know the person, or it's yeah. whatever the trust, but trust is the reason. So that, that I find very interesting. So somebody wants to know from you, what do you think? Because they know you and they've worked with you and they, yeah, have a competence with you. Yeah, exactly. And somehow you only build that confidence by being there as a person. And I have to say, I noticed that with now in London, where nobody knows me. Well, the researchers know me, but the clinicians don't. And I don't do clinical work here. I only do research here. But um, I still need their input. I still need um, to include patients in studies. And I've you know, I've been introduced to people numerous times. I've introduced myself numerous times. They don't. They always forget who I am, and they um, don't respond to my emails at all. They just, even though I've been introduced, I've introduced myself again. This is a study I'm doing. I need patients for this study. You know, we've agreed to do this email, and nobody will respond. So again, you because just need to build that. Yeah, they need to they need to know what I do. They don't believe sort of just my long list of titles. They actually, if I read their scans for three months while I was here, I'm sure they would be more than happy to to provide me with any because that is a working relationship I have in Rotterdam. So I know what it could be like, but I I now see what I've built, um, which yeah, which is lacking uh, in that department, to be honest. Interesting. So because of your in-person relationships, then you're able to to ask more. Yeah. Well, well these are people that have yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah, of course that makes sense, but it's interest you I mean, I so my remote work is all work for Rotterdam. I mean, and that's where I have my relationships. Um so in a way, I, yeah, obviously I had to build those relationships first, whereas the other way around, I'm actually here in London. And I don't get my studies going um, 
at the moment. And it's, uh, I, I'm sure if I sit in their sort of uh, office for a little while longer, I'll get there, but it, it's taking me a lot of time. <laughs> So it's because you don't have the you haven't had the in person relationships exactly, built exactly. up yet in London. So it's funny that you're actually in London, but it's more remote than what the not yeah, being in a way. It <laughs> it's uh, yeah. <laughs> have you had relationships, professional virtual relationships, where you've not met the person before ever? It's been completely virtual from start to finish. Um, I mean not. Close collaborations, I think. Um, I mean, there's, uh, yeah, sure, there's been people in meetings that, you know, I've only spoken to remotely, but never one on one, I think. Um, I, I have to say, I tend to, if I start working with somebody, um, and uh, so I, I contact them, and, and for instance, I'm organizing, I'm, I organize a European course once a year, and um, I always try to meet, uh, this is in, different sort of hospitals in, in Europe. Um, and I know, don't usually know the person who's then locally organizing it and I'm doing, well, the general organization. So I tend to really just meet up with them somehow at first. Um, somewhere at a conference or say, are you going to be there or whatever. Um, and then it takes off just fine. But I, th I really, I mean, I find it important as well. I value it. I, I'd like to to meet somebody face to face first. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's always ideal when we can be face to face and I'm I'm really looking into the exploration of what if we can't meet face to face? What happens then? What if, you know, what's if there if somebody's just on the other side of the world or the money issue yeah. or you know, whatever the issue is, there's millions of things that get in the way of us meeting, but but what happens then? So I I'm, I'm looking closely into into professional virtual relationships to see yeah. What happens? You're right. Yeah. Although I have to say, when it's when it's a Skype meeting, I think that that makes up for a lot and could actually be just as good or even better. Because again, I, I quite often meet people at conferences, um, and then you know it's so busy. There's always hundreds of other people that know the person that you want to talk to, or vice versa. You know, if I stand, if I meet somebody in a sort of the coffee bar at the conference center, there's you know so many people that will interrupt because they see me and they want to chat or they see the other person and want to chat and it's like well we're actually in sort of a meeting here so in a way Skype is actually almost again more focused and isolated um, but what I have to, I mean what I notice is that yeah not everybody is as comfortable with it as I am and uh, and that is a big problem that a lot of people I work with just don't even you know they say oh I don't, I don't know about this Skype and Google Hangout is, is definitely not something uh, uh, people use. And uh, yeah, I was like, oh, well, can't we just call? And that's, I mean, I hate, hate the telephone. I really do. So <laughs> I just can't do that. So uh, Interesting. Yeah. It didn't occur to me that people would be, of course, because in my, you know, my world is, I'm, I'm yeah. surrounded by these tools and I'm a tool junkie myself, so I, I don't think of it like this. But it's a really good reminder, you're right, that not a lot of people are very comfortable with some of the most very basic things that, yeah. that people use, like Skype. I'm yeah, surprised. exactly. Yeah, I mean the, the people that that you that do use it are the is is well my generation and younger, and a lot of the people I work with are older. I I, I just I am in a position where still most people are a lot older than me, uh, so they haven't grown up with it. I mean I'm not saying that my generation uses it a lot. Work-wise, but a lot of people, of course, use it for their well to keep in touch with their kids and whatever, and um, and they're used to it. But yeah, it's. I mean, I, I that's the only thing actually that hasn't worked while I was here is that I'm secretary of the board for the Dutch uh, section of neuroradiology, and I'd set up Skype meetings. I said, well, I'm not in the Netherlands. We do this remotely over telephone generally, and I said, well. I mean that's going to be expensive for me, and you know that's just Skype, and it's been a total disaster. It's I mean we could just get the video component, which is so useful to have. Yeah, that. but yeah, they. I mean that, that's even I didn't even try. I mean we couldn't even connect. Uh, they wouldn't find any. I mean they had to had to find somebody to help them install it on their computer, and then you know it. It was I gave up. I thought, well, this is yeah. I'll just wow. I'll just use telephone. 
and um, yeah, it's it's difficult because I'm thinking, why do you need somebody? to install it you know it's, it's just you don't need tech support to install Skype and uh, and and then they'd be like oh yeah I guess we don't have good internet here it's like well you do have a laptop you know find somewhere with good internet you know that this is important and, uh, that realization is just well this doesn't work it's like well just like your phone wouldn't work if you don't have a connection you know it's just, right well, what's, what's surprising to me is that these are not dumb people. These are all no, highly no. educated, highly technically savvy, in a different way, people. So, the, I mean, it's really an eye-opener and a good reminder, I think, that that the technology is really a barrier. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, it, I I mean, I, I sometimes, I, I just, yeah, it, it, it surprises me, to be honest. Because, as you say, these are smart people. We work, I mean, radiology, we are the technical crowd in the hospital, which is not technical, technical, but still, you know, we're supposed to, you know, be at least a little bit... Uh, <laughs> well, you have to deal okay. with the fancy equipment, I'm assuming. Exactly, not exactly. Like regular people can use it. So, um, yeah... And, and 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 it's not just it's not that they can't do it because of course they can. It's just a sort of also a resistance. You know, I'm I'm the one who uses social media. So like, well, Skype is not social media. You know, yes. And <laughs> right. So right. Uh, yeah. Um, well, the generational gap I think is a really important one for yeah. most industries, and actually really inspires me to look further than the industries that I've been looking into other places as well because I think that this is an issue. You know, yeah. not only is culture an issue, but also this generational gap that really is a serious issue. Yeah, and people have to, especially if they're not used to it a lot. I mean, I do a lot of um, online meetings and stuff like that, but there's lots of lots of people who don't, and and they they don't have the etiquette. They they will not mute themselves on the meeting, or you know, have not, don't have the equipment, so they yeah. Uh, won't have a sign on the door that they can't be disturbed. Uh, so you hear their beepers and a phone or whatever, and they will easily take the phone as well, you know, phone call as well, while they're on the meeting, not on mute. And uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> it's it's yeah. I I can I can sort of understand that if you're not aware and you don't use it a lot, then it's actually not obvious. But um, uh, yeah. There right. is a lot of education required as well sometimes. Yeah, there's there's rookie mistakes that, uh, I mean, we've all been there at one point, but usually it's been a long time ago. <laughs> so, but yeah. I, you know, when I interviewed NASA even, um, that was an interesting interview, but they do a lot of hand-holding for all their researchers all over the world. They really take people and they set them up with the right equipment and they have particular lists of things that they must have if you want to work together. Um, but they really do one-on-one -on -one sessions with many, many people to get them all being able to collaborate remotely. So that's interesting. Yeah, but I think that really, really helps because, as I said, you know, I, I, I do stumble my way around a little bit, and uh, and so, and hopefully you see somebody else make the mistake before you do it and realize, well, okay, I shouldn't do that. But uh, yeah, it's so much easier if somebody actually tells you how to do it. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's a different culture. I mean, we have NASA who is, uh, they have to work remotely. I mean, that yeah. NASA is all, I mean, it's the extreme remote working, really, if we think about, you know, intergalactic yeah. working <laughs> and then exploration. But um, um, I think it would have to become more a part of the academic culture and the clinical culture for that kind of hands-on education to happen. Yeah. So I only have one, we're nearing the end of our time. This has been great. I knew I'd learned something new today. So, <laughs> good reminders. But only one final question, which is, if people want to learn more about you and what you do, where what's the best place to find you? Oh, um, well, I do have a website, um, which I uh, don't update loads, but I, my Twitter feeds to that as well. So that's marionsmiths.net. And I have a LinkedIn profile, which just shows where I am and what I do. And they can and always email me. And a Twitter profile as well. I yes, think. yes. So I'm at Marion Smith. That's uh... great. So MarionSmiths.net and at Marion Smith on Twitter. And of course, I'll post these in the show liner notes for everybody. But is, so, is there anything else that I haven't covered that you had in your notes 
No. Now we oh, should. My notes, my notes <laughs> have, uh, have gone to sleep. Let me see. I think we've done most of it. I just want to make sure because sometimes when yeah. there's a new subject or a new topic like neuroradiology, which I know nothing about, sometimes I don't know which questions are the right questions to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure we the neuroradiology I always talk about loads anyway. So, yeah, I think um, I don't have anything else. No. Great. Well, then if I uh, have any follow-up questions, I'll be sure to email you. Great. Please Great. do. Well, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And until next time, everybody, be powerful.